those companies that were being most innovative were the ones that were able to, to, to capitalize on digital technologies to uh, increase the creativity of their workforce and stimulate innovation. So it was on that basis that we identified Industry 5.0 around three pillars that are very much interlinked. First of all, human centricity. So seeing uh, workers as an investment rather than a cost for the, for the company um, and using digital technologies to empower them and to make them agents of change to drive innovation in the company. Secondly, sustainability. Capitalizing on digital te technologies to help companies in a positive way to support their sustainability by by uh, using digital technologies to identify ways of doing more with less, by developing full products life cycle processes that really help them to be more sustainable. And thirdly, uh, really focusing on uh, the, the way in which digital technologies can be used in a dynamic and flexible way uh, in order to make companies more resilient. Um, in recent years, we've seen the, the difficulties for companies arising from uh, uh, raw material shortages, supply chain disruptions, and of course that was really emphasized by the, during the COVID pandemic and now the geopolitical disturbance caused by the, the war in Ukraine. So the, the idea of the glo very uh, rigid global uh, uh, supply chains really don't work anymore and you need to use digital technologies in a, in a flexible way to help the company to adapt quickly to changes in its circumstances. So really, uh, uh, we came at this from the point of view of um, seeing digital technologies be more human, uh, used in a more human-centric way to also drive sustainability and resilience. Well, <laughs> that's quite a lot in a nutshell. Um, Jan Cook, tell us a bit about what you're working on and uh, why, why you're on the panel. <laughs> uh, yes, so now I'm working as an assistant professor in KTH Royal Institute of uh, Technology in Sweden and my department is production engineering. And in the production engineering, my field is production logistics. And as you know, uh, so we deal about like um, all the moving goods or data information in production site. And most of the production site, they are very oriented to uh, efficiency or the digitalization. But in the production logistics, we still have some human there. And I see the Industry 5.0 is a good guideline for the transition. Because even though we are developing some new technologies for production systems, but still we have the human. And I have some project about uh, what, where is the, uh, the way of going in this uh, area. So we have some conducted literature review and the surveys and we analyze the ongoing project in KTH and other uh, universities as well. So I would like to like, a, maybe more emphasize the human-centric perspective and industry academia collaboration in terms of Industry 5.0 today. So maybe that's why I'm here. Thank you. Harold, uh, tell us your thinking on Industry 5.0. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I have to mention that I'm a, a co-speaker of the German Research Council on Industry 4.0 and a uh, member of the steering body of the platform Industry 4.0. And uh, we, we are not thinking about renaming us to 5.0, although all the topics mentioned are in the focus of our activities. So, if we talk about 4.0, we include these, um, these topics such as human centricity, sustainability, resilience uh, from the start on because they were already mentioned in the 2013 paper on Industry 4.0. Um, nevertheless, uh, coining a new term might be good to raise more the, um, uh, the awareness um, in the European level we notice that these are topics that you cannot just ignore. Human centricity is important because also people are changing. I mean, the new, new workforces that come into companies now, they are used to digital technologies. They are digital natives. Yeah? And they expect their work environment to be digitalized. And we lack a lot of progress there in the real implementation of our factories. Yeah, so we are already um, researching on uh, how to use AR or um, extended reality uh, to help people to make them feel comfortable with their working environment. I mean, no one wants to do the paperwork anymore. Yeah? They want to do it in a digital way. 
And um, the same is true with, with the sustainability thing. Uh, people want to see products that are designed from the beginning for being reused or recycled or upcycled later. And you also have to see the European dimension. Um, we are short of some raw materials and depending on raw materials from, from countries that are outside of Europe. And with a circular economy that is enabled by Industry 4.0 or 5.0, whatever, um, we create another source of raw material within Europe, so it even increases the resilience. So the topics are very, very hot, very important, uh, and also in the discussions in Germany. Well, Harold, you've raised the issue of definitions, and this is one I want to tackle first. Um, Sean, I think a lot of people would say we haven't really already delivered on 4.0. Is it, are we getting ahead of ourselves in already trying to define a new paradigm with 5.0, or does it not really matter what terms we're using to describe the same thing? And Yanni, I'm coming back to you on this. <laughs> but, I, I, I think Harold is correct that we shouldn't get too hung up on, on, on titles, but... Industry 5.0, it's not a chronological follow-on from Industry 4.0, but it, it, it reflects the fact that conditions have changed. Conditions which businesses are operating uh, have changed, uh, firstly, and that um, now, indus now industry needs to um, be more focused on its impact. Uh, there was a clear impression that industry, uh, with this focus on, uh, on digitalization to drive down costs and enhance productivity, had maybe become too focused on the factory floor and had a little bit become disengaged from its wider role in the economy and society. Um, and was indeed perhaps be becoming less attractive to young people coming onto the, the jobs market. Harold, you made the point that this is the first generation that is digitally literate, um, but industry is in competition with many other sectors for these excellent people. Mm -hmm. um, also, as we've seen uh, with what's become known as the, the great resignation in the United States, people will leave a company that doesn't share their values. And young people coming onto the job market now want to work for an employer, uh, not only who pays them a good salary, but who takes seriously um, their career prospects in terms of, of uh, skill development and empowerment uh, and having a, 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 a dynamic and interesting job. And also a company that takes its responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, resilience and, and sustainability properly um, so that it is, it is seen as a valued part of, of society. So I think Industry 5.0, we're looking, we're taking a broader look at the, the role of the company in, in, in the economy and society and also recognizing the fact that the, 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 the uh, very, folk, very straightforward global market environment of 13 years ago has been disrupted by a number of, of, of yeah. actors, and therefore we need to, to, to look in a different way at the same things. But I don't think we should get too hung up on titles. Well, I am still going to say to Yanni, I mean, I can't think that I'd heard of the industrial metaverse before, um, but of course metaverse is a, a huge buzzword. I mean, is this just trying to make uh, the factory floor sexy? Hmm. Well, maybe it's a small attempt on, on that one. Um, I, I kind of uh, agree with my, my panel co colleagues here that uh, it's, it's more about having this uh, holistic view on, on, on this industrial 4.0 or 5.0, whatever term you now want to use. And, and there, there has this um, raised understanding of the situation that it's not anymore optimizing. It's it's like, like making your business uh, generative, like uh, being a planet positive. That that you you need to have that as a part of your business. That that you actually <laughs> not just optimize the consumption, but you actually optimize that how much you do good for for the planet. So yeah, but the metaverse. If if coming back to that, I think that's just one of the underlying technologies that will enable this transformation that is coming up. Well, we'll park that for now. So we'll, we'll, we've talked a little bit about the what. The difficult part is always the how. How do we achieve these sort of human-centric, collaborative, sustainable, and yet high productivity goals that, that we seem to be marrying together under this umbrella term? Um, Jan Cook, Will it happen by market forces, or are we going to need some sort of regulation to get to where we want to go? What's your take? Um, 
I think uh, Industry 5.0 and the Industry 4.0 right now is a transition because I think the, maybe some advanced OEMs like uh, bigger players, they are already reached Industry 4.0 and they are ready to go to further. But we have small and medium companies and maybe there are differences between academia and industry and maybe developed countries and developing countries as well. So I see this one as a transition. And to achieve this, I think we should have a, like a clear goal, and then uh, we the the bigger players can maybe be the leader of this like a use cases, and the small and medium companies get some like a benefit from the bigger players as well. And also same for the industry, academia, and the regulations as well. So I see this is a, like a long run. We, we will achieve maybe efficiency and uh, the customer's involvement and uh, the young people will join the like, uh, visionary companies later. But maybe in the short term, we need some regulations because nowadays maybe some companies, they are investing ESG and the sustainability because they can get some benefit at this moment. So as a short term, I think we need some kind of regulation, but I see it as a long Wrong run because this is a transition. So at the end, we will get some improvement in the bigger perspective. How else, you? Yeah, on the regulation. I mean, we have a lot. We have seen a lot of regulation uh, in the in the last years that's coming from the European Commission. And it's it's of course good that we have all these ESG reporting things, but we should be careful with introducing new regulations because. We have the AI Act, we have the Data Governance Act, we have the Data Act coming up. So it's a lot of things that really um, create uncertainty with the companies. What does that all mean? Uh, what are the consequences of that? And for example, the Data Governance Act has, has destroyed some business models that were just raising up uh, in the area of data sharing because, well, I, I don't go into the details why that's the case, but. Um, so I, I think it's, it's enough of regulation at the moment. Um, we, are, we have to consume all the new regulations and adapt in the industry and uh, even more regulation that would not benefit, but it would, uh, would hinder European industry. Yeah? Um, and of course, industry is doing a lot at the moment to increase all the ESG aspects because People are demanding it. The employees are demanding it. The customers are demanding it, at least in Europe. Um, and that should be enough uh, to drive the, the whole uh, movement. Well, I always say when we talk about laws, and in particular EU laws, if there were no bad actors, we wouldn't need any laws at all. If everyone behaved ethically and responsibly, um, then, then the Commission would be out of a job, really. Um, but, Sean, let me bring you in here. Um, not to focus overly on necessarily the legislative slide, but tell me whether you think we're creating the right conditions uh, and what might those conditions be for a successful transition to 5.0. Well, I, I would certainly uh, agree that it's, uh, um, this process must be driven by innovation and we shouldn't do anything that in any way hampers innovation. Um, I think the, the, and it is for industry to adopt Industry 5.0 and the role, uh, our role um, at the European level really should be uh, to, f to, to, to ensure the right framework conditions are in place. So making sure that at policy level there is coherence, what we're doing across different areas, um, that um, there is a, a clear directionality and that there's a, the appropriate level of incentives. And I think we, what's important is we need to look in a broad way across policy areas, looking at environment policy, uh, employment policy to make sure that the, the, the right incentives are there, uh, education policy to make sure that there's proper uh, STEM uh, skills training, uh, also regional and social policy to make sure that this, uh, these opportunities are available to, across regions and to all players in society. And also we need to look at, at taxation policy, uh, make sure that taxation policy also supports uh, the, more in, the, the innovation that's necessary to make uh, this transition and this transformation happen. And of course, on the research and innovation side, we see it as very important as well to, to uh, uh, have programs and, and policies in place that support this innovation. So yeah, we, we definitely need the proper framework conditions and we need to look in a broad way at these to make sure that the system is, is working in the same direction. 
Well, I want to talk about skills now as well, because having a, a skilled workforce is obviously a precondition. Um, and you've mentioned that already, we have digital natives. Yanni, do you see any gaps? Or are there any concerns? Or, or do you see that there's so much great young talent coming down the line that, uh, that we're going to be fine? Well, I personally, definitely I see gaps. Uh, I, in in Bell Labs, uh, we do research and we try to do cutting edge research and, and actually <laughs> there is always a scarcity of, of good resources um, and, and talented uh, resources. What comes to this tra transformation and so on, I have a little bit hope on our younger generation that the mindset is different and maybe they are choosing more wisely their, <laughs> their uh, education and, and have more uh, and better, better kind of um, suitable education for, for this topic uh, like um, sustainability and so on. At least I see that in my kids and, and, and so on. Um, but yes, there is a gap. And if you think about the geopolitical thing, I think there is a bigger gap in, uh, in Europe than in the US. Uh, Johan Kok, I mean, could you expand a little bit on that? I'm sure you'd say you're, you're doing fabulous in Sweden. Um, do you see any other gaps around Europe or, um, as Yali mentions, compared to the US or Southeast Asia or, or other parts of the world? In terms of like... In terms of the skill set, in terms of the, the, the workforce that's there and coming. Um, for example, in Sweden, yeah, I, I have maybe know, know more about Swedish case, uh, cases, so I'll talk about the Swedish case. So in terms of Sweden, uh, there are many reskilling and upskilling programs for the employees. So it is not only for the young, young students and young people. So I think they are already engaged in sustainability. They are aware about their future, so they are concerned about it. And also, because of the digitalization, many people are worried about, can I still work in this field? Uh, can I like, use my skill in the next five or 10 years? So in Swedish universities, we have some, um, in, we call it engineer 4.0 program, even though we are using 4.0, but they are more talking about reskilling the current workers for the digitalization and how they, like, for example, use the robot or they use the digital twin in their work. So there are many uh, upskilling and reskilling programs in Sweden. But I guess other, com other countries and other regions are doing this similar in a way. Well, Sean, we often talk about Europe as being in a race with other parts of the world in, in whatever context, uh, eco uh, economically or industrially. Do you have any insight onto which, where and which areas globally are sort of best placed to, uh, to race ahead in the 4.0 race, or 5.0 race, sorry? Well, I think it's a, it's a very relevant point because uh, I think we were ahead of the game when we, we, we developed the concept, but in, in, the, in the two years, two, two to three years since then, we're seeing other parts of the world uh, really catching up with us. I mean, if you look at the US, um, the uh, Biden administration's Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, Industry 5.0 uh, is at the heart of that. It, it, it's, all, it's, it's about bringing uh, manufacturing back and bringing people, putting people at the, people at the center of it. And you know, we're already seeing in MIT, they're reorientating their, their manufacturing programs um, to, to focus on, on, on delivering the skills. And they have a very interesting initiative, uh, they call it the Hub and Spoke Initiative, where they develop it, it's an MIT quality program, but it's being delivered right across the, the, the states of the US, close to where the companies are that need these skills, so that uh, their workers can acquire the, the, the skills development on an ongoing basis, uh, close to where they're working. We, we, I mean, in Europe, EIT is doing really good work in, in that area. We work a lot with our colleagues in EIT manufacturing, and they're bringing their, their programs uh, very much into line with the Industry 5.0 principles. But we, we're good at talking about things in Europe, and in other parts of the world, maybe they move, they move ahead faster. In Australia, they're just beginning now uh, to, to, to uh, understand the opportunity of Industry 5.0, and they've, they've developed now in, um, in, uh, uh, the, in Queensland a, 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 a trial program which is very close to Industry 5.0, combining training and coaching and, and so on. And in areas like, like, like India and Pakistan, they're, they're really jumping on the Industry 5.0 bandwagon very quickly. So, yeah, we, we very fast other parts of the world are, are catching up with us. So we, we need not only to talk about Industry 5.0, but we need to make sure that we're putting it in place, particularly putting in place the skills that are needed. 
Harold, let me ask you about collaboration and in particular public-private partnerships and, and uh, working groups, this whole uh, topic that we like so much in Brussels. How important is that and do you see it happening enough at the moment? Are there any good examples or are there any bad examples? Well, um, yeah, I see some, some good examples uh, in that. Um, we have um, public-private partnerships in the data area, we have pu public-private partnerships in the industrial area as well. And uh, as far as I can see, or as, as I can say, they are, they are quite successful because uh, the Commission works together with, uh, with all the stakeholders, industry and research, in these partnerships to develop the right research programs. So that's, that's very successful. Um, but that's the research side that I know. Um, on the other hand, I'm not sure what public-private partnerships can do in addition. Yeah, for example, concerning the procurement, concerning fostering the, the usage of these new te technologies, not just the development. I'm, I'm just lacking ideas there. Uh, Yanni, what, if anything, would you like to see change rapidly in the next five years? In, yeah, in, in, in relation to this topic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I hope that there is more adaptation of, of these new technologies, that we start really utilizing those. So I think that's, that's the thing. Then I, I hope this legislation and all that brings this visibility and transparency that it's more fair to co compete at the market because I think that's also the, uh, the driving force that once, once uh, you can really have the visibility and, and say that I do it right and, and our company have the, <laughs> the, the right measures to do it, I think that that gives you the competitive advantage and, and so on. So I, I hope the transparency happens, I hope that there is a faster adaptation of, of the new technologies. Uh, yeah, I, I would take those two. Uh, Jan Cook, I, um, I mean, we, we've talked about the human-centric nature and we've said that collaboration is important. I mean, some other factors that fall under the umbrella of 5.0 is personalization or customization, sustainability, resilience, and decentralization. I mean, of those four or five areas, is there one that stands out to you as potentially having the most impact? Uh, well, maybe the personalization is also related to human-centric as well, because as a, like an employee or the person who will do their work, they will get more motivated if the environment is more personalized. There was one research that was talking about uh, industrial human needs, that there was a pyramid, and when the people, uh, how, when, what is the need for the people? So the first one was the safety, and, and that the next one is healthy, and the next one is the belonging and esteem and the self-actualization. And I think that the last two parts are more in, in, uh, correlated to the, the technological perspective, but the other, like belongings and uh, uh, like self-esteem or the self-actualization, it, it, the people can feel more when it is more customized. So one example that I have involved in one project with the steel manufacturing company, and we have interviewed the the drivers in the factories because we are developing some autonomous uh, transportation system for them. So we thought that, okay, this is our solution and we will give you the direction to you where you go and where to pick and so on. And the driver says, no, but I don't want to just follow the AI's recommendation. I want to have my options so I can do my work and I can feel get more motivated. I think it, this was a really good example for me. Aha, there was something else. We should not just provide. Maybe we need to hear the people who will use these technologies and also uh, how can get more involved and get motivated people. So I think the personalization is the really important part. Sean, same question to you. I mean, where do you think the biggest impact will be? I mean, I, I mentioned sustainability and resilience and decentralization as well. well I would maybe se separate out um, uh, sustainability and resilience as two goals we need to achieve. But I think there are, there are a lot of driving forces. This, this uh, need for, for greater customization uh, that people want, that the, that the market is demanding, uh, the opportunity for, for greater personalization. I think, and these co coupled with uh, some of the, the technologies that, that Yanni has talked about, these can all help us to, to, to uh, move in the, in, the, in the appropriate direction. 
Um, I, I think at this moment, resilience is probably uh, at this punctually the critical thing we need to get right because we're still in a very uncertain business environment. Um, on, on sustainability, I think what's important is that the digital technologies are used in a way so that companies don't no, no longer think about it in terms of not doing the bad things, but rather making a positive contribution to sustainability by using digitalization to uh, uh, improve their, 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 their production processes and, and succeed in that way. I think you're right on resilience. We, had a, we kicked off yesterday morning with a panel on semiconductor supply chains, and that was the point that kept being raised. I would, like to, I would like to actually pick the decentralization yeah. because uh, um, we do a lot of research on Web3 type of uh, software and now I see a big opportunity to combine that with this kind of uh, manufacturing and, and it, it could affect the um, supply chains, it could affect the way how you, how you kind of make your investments at your factory and then how you distribute your factory uh, assets and so on. So I, I would pick that one as the next disrupt, disruptive uh, uh, thing and, and the biggest thing in this one. Harold, do you want to pick, <laughs> pick one <laughs> or shall I ask you the, the question about investment? No, I, I, fully, I fully, fully agree to what, what has been said, but I want to uh, highlight uh, the sustainability part a little bit. Um, currently, we are talking a lot about CO2 footprint, but we are not able to really measure the real CO2 footprint over scope one, scope two, scope three in reality. So it's all models, it's all estimations, and you don't really know what's happening. And as long as you don't know, you can't change. Yeah? Uh, and we need to change, of course. Yeah? We, we should all agree on that. So um, that's, that's one thing that I see as, as very much important uh, to improve there, and also to improve, I mean, Sustainability is not just CO2, it's also um, reusing material. And we're seeing a lot of initiatives there, um, but it's just in the beginning. And there is no clear goal on how, how far we should go. I mean, uh, consider the building industry. Uh, concrete is, is known to be, um, depending on sand, which is a rare resource nowadays, <laughs> interestingly, <laughs> Um, it, it's creating a lot of CO2 and so on. But on the other hand, the de deconstruction of buildings creates a lot of material. But that material is rarely used to build new buildings. Uh, maybe because of regulation, maybe because of uh, technology issues. So improving in that uh, aspect is, from my point of view, very, very important, in particular for Europe. We should have had you at EIT Raw Materials a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> talking about that very subject. Um, to wrap up, I mean, I, I wanted to quickly touch on the point of investment into innovation, into R&D, um, and where that fits within this ecosystem, shall we call it. Um, Sean, what do we need, and, and how fast do we need it? I think we need... Um First of all, we need, we need commitment uh, to, to really move forward with the transformation quickly. I think we need m more an engagement and investment by companies uh, in ongoing skills development, seeing uh, skills as, 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 as a strategic tool for the company so that uh, it's a way of empowering workers. It's also a way of offering workers a, a stimulating career, so we certainly need something there. And I think we also uh, need in, in investment in, in innovation and uh, opening up opportunities for cross-sectoral cooperation so that we, we really see that the, the opportunities that digitalization uh, can, can have for industry in terms of moving out of the old uh, uh, sectoral silos and bringing ideas together across sectors and companies coming together to develop new, new markets and new opportunities across sectors. Uh, Jan Cook, what are the next steps then, thinking more near term, um, in achieving the aims that we want to achieve with 
I was thinking about like uh, the regulations and rules are very important to get innovative because maybe people are in the box and they will think about something creativity. But also the regulation and the rules can limit the people's thinking. So maybe some kind of regulation free sandbox for the innovative companies or innovative research institutes so they can do whatever they want. It should be regulated but <laughs> some more innovative space. I think that will uh, that can be helpful. Are you suggest the sort of regulatory sandboxes that we talk about? Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Harold, your thoughts on, on where the direction of travel and the speed of travel, um, are we getting that right? Well, it's uh, in an economic situation that we have at the moment, it's not, it's not easy for companies to invest in technologies that are maybe far off. Yeah? Uh, so we have to show the companies uh, the the low-hanging fruits, yeah? even in, in uh, respect to sustainability, to human centricity, and so on. And, uh, and to do so, it's very important to bridge the research activities that are there and that have, have done great progress on, on all these areas with real industries, industrial implementation. Um, in particular, in, in Germany, it's, it's difficult because we have a lot of world-leading companies, real champions, but they are small and they are very distributed over, over Germany. So 99% of the German industry is small and medium enterprises. Um, and to, to distribute all the knowledge to them, that's, that's a hard issue and we should work very hard on, to do that. Um, Jani, I said at the beginning that uh, there could be criticism that we haven't achieved 4.0. As Sean points out, it's not necessarily a next iteration uh, to get to 5.0. But how fast are we going to get there? When do you think we'll be looking back and saying, oh, that's job done, tick the box? Um, you mean to industry 5.0? How yeah. fast? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and why? <laughs> well, I. I think it's a, it's a transformation and there are businesses and industries in different stages. So most probably it's a hard to say that when, <laughs> when we have reached that and we can claim that now we are there, uh, can we even claim that we have done Industry 4.0? At least I have been in a businesses that they, they are not even close. Uh, so my answer is that hopefully some companies will reach that soon and, and the others follow fast. So watch this space. Oh, uh, I think that some of the companies are almost there. I, yeah. Because now, okay, it's, it depends how you define it and how widely you want to think about it. But, but um, I, I would say that, uh, for example, Nokia is uh, quite well on, on, its, on its way. Well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been an interesting discussion. I don't think we've solved all the issues or answered, indeed, all the questions at this point, but we were never going to achieve that in 45 minutes. So thank you very much. A big round of applause for our speakers, please.